The anemias are a truly massive and interesting topic, but in order to get to the diseases themselves, we've got to get some basics down first. And the first, most basic thing to know about anemia is that it has to do with blood. We've all seen the components of blood numerous times, but for the sake of review, let's take it real slow in the beginning and get back to basics. Of the myriad chemicals and proteins that float around our bodies in the blood, we're going to be focusing on the cells and cell pieces that are present. There are three main components to discuss, and each has its own function. They are the red blood cells, or RBCs, also known as erythrocytes, which carry oxygen around the body using hemoglobin. There are white blood cells, also known as leukocytes, which from here on out I'll refer to as WBCs, which together form the cellular component of our immune system. And the third component is the platelet, each of which is really just a piece of a larger cell called a megakaryocyte, but we'll get to that in just a bit. Platelets are there to participate in hemostasis, to make sure that blood clots form appropriately, and to plug any holes that may develop in the circulatory system. In a given amount of blood, there are lots and lots of RBCs, way less platelets, and a tiny amount of WBCs. If you think better in ratios, the RBC to platelet to WBC ratio is roughly 1,000 to 40 to 1. There's three times as many white blood cells produced in the bone marrow as red blood cells, but since the white blood cells live for much less time, as we'll see in a minute, there's far fewer of them in peripheral blood. Now the WBCs are not just one type of cell, but rather a whole slew of individualized cells that each has a specific role to play and a characteristic function in the body. Let's review those here, and we'll make a list under our WBC heading. There are five main types of white blood cells. Neutrophils, eosinophils, basophils, monocytes, and lymphocytes. And we'll go over each of these in turn and talk about their shape, size, and how they look under the microscope. The first way to break down the WBCs is by their appearance under the microscope. Three of these appear to have little granules in their cytoplasm under high enough power, so together they're called the granulocytes. And these three are the neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils. So we'll just make a note of that under our growing list of the WBCs. Now I'm a big fan of acronyms to help me remember these facts and tidbits, so I refer to these as the NEB cells. So let's just make a quick note of that. NEB. These cells are so named due to the way they pick up H&E stain. Eosinophils stain red because they love eosin, hence the name eosinophil. Basophils are the same for basic dyes, such as hematoxylin, and they stain blue. And neutrophils are somewhere in the middle. They actually stain pink, so we'll underline the N in pink, hence the name neutrophil. Nowadays, these cells are stained with right stain, but since they were stained mostly with hematoxylin and eosin in the past, the name stuck. The other two white blood cells don't have little granules when viewed under the microscope, so together they're called the A granulocytes, and these are made up by the monocyte and lymphocyte populations together. So let's talk briefly about each of the cell types we've covered thus far, starting with the red blood cells. In each case, I'll show a picture of what each cell type looks like under the microscope. So let's get started with the red blood cells, or as we know they go by their other name, erythrocytes. And this picture, as we see here, is what red blood cells look like under the microscope. Now for these red blood cells, we're going to, be going to be talking about three different properties. Their size, lifespan, and their role. And we'll do each one sequentially. So how big is a red blood cell? It turns out that each one of these cells, that looks kind of like a donut, is roughly 7.5 micrometers in diameter, which makes it a perfect size to fit through even the tiniest vessels in your body. And the shape I'll write down is biconcave, which means that the center is thinner than the outside, which is why these cells look like donuts. The light is easier passing through the center of the cell than the outside. And the reason they're so clear is because they don't have any nucleus or organelles. This biconcave shape of the RBCs allows easier traveling through the circulatory system, since they can bend and flex to access even the smallest blood vessels. As far as their lifespan, red blood cells live about 120 days. And their role, we know, is to carry oxygen around the body. The next cell we're going to look at is the neutrophil. And this here is a picture of one, so we'll go and label this picture neutrophil. And neutrophils are also known as PMNs. 
And like we did with the RBC, we're going to be talking about the size, lifespan, and role of this type of cell. Now you can see that there are some RBCs in this picture, which I'll just go ahead and label RBC. And we know these are roughly 7.5 micrometers, and we can see that the neutrophil is about twice that size. So I'll go ahead and say 2x RBC. In terms of the lifespan, they only live a few days, so just write days. And neutrophils are really active when it comes to inflammation, so we'll just write this down under role. Inflammation. You can see in this picture little circles inside the neutrophil, and those are the granules, which is what make this part of the granulocyte portion of the white blood cell population. You can also see that the neutrophils have a characteristic lobed nucleus, and this is uh, common to all of the granulocytes, the eosinophils and basophils as well. Another thing about neutrophils is that they're the most common white blood cell that's present in blood. Continuing our look at the granulocytes, the next cell we'll take a look at is the eosinophil. So let's go ahead and label this picture eosinophil. And there's a couple of things that jump out right away. The first is the presence of these red granules, which is where the eosinophil gets its name. It takes the red from the eosin, since it likes eosin, it gets the name eosinophil. The second thing is the presence of a bilobed nucleus, like there was in the neutrophil, and like there will be in the basophil as well, and I'll outline that here in blue. In terms of the size of the eosinophil, there are red blood cells here in this picture as a point of comparison, and it's maybe one and a half to two times the diameter. In terms of the role of the eosinophil, it's really for getting rid of parasites that happen to get into the body. Uh, what's contained in these granules is an antiparasitic slew of chemicals which can get rid of the parasites if they happen to enter the body. Let's continue our tour of the cells by looking at the basophil, which we can see here. So we can label this picture basophil. And like we saw with the neutrophil and the eosinophil, there are granules here, but these happen to be a little darker. They're on the bluish side, and that makes sense because the basophil takes its name from its attraction to the blue dye, hematoxylin. We also notice a multi-lobed nucleus, which I'll outline here in blue. The same as the neutrophil and the eosinophil, the other members of the granulocyte population. In terms of the lifespan of the basophil, these cells live for a really long time. Could be years or more. So we'll say years plus. And in terms of the role of the basophil, they're really involved in the allergic response. So I'll write allergic response. So we've taken a look now at the neutrophil, the eosinophil, and the basophil, all the members of the granulocyte population. So let's now take a look at the agranulocytes, starting with the monocyte. And we can go ahead and label this picture monocyte. So immediately we notice a difference from the granulocytes, and that's that there's no granules here. And that makes sense because the monocyte is one of the two members of the agranulocyte population. Now in terms of the role of the monocyte, they actually develop into another type of cell called the macrophage. So I'll draw an arrow, meaning develop into, and write macrophage. In terms of their size, the monocyte is actually the largest of the white blood cells. So I'll just put down largest. And you can see that in this picture, if this is about 7.5 micrometers, the monocyte is actually considerably larger, maybe 2 to 2.5 times the size of a red blood cell. The last of the white blood cells to look at is the lymphocyte, and that's visible here. So let's go ahead and label this picture lymphocyte. And we can see right away that it doesn't have any granules, but we can also see that the nucleus is rather large, taking up almost the entire volume of the cell. In terms of the lifespan of the lymphocyte, they actually live for months to years, which is a pretty long time. So we'll say months to years. And as far as the role of the lymphocyte, this we've actually covered before in the immunology module. Lymphocytes actually develop into B and T cells, the, some of the major cells of the immune system. The last cell type to look at is the platelet, visible here. So let's go ahead and label this picture platelet. And platelets are actually fragments of cells, and I'll go ahead and outline it in red here. This tiny little thing right here, and as a point of comparison, what's next to it is an RBC. So in terms of their size, 
Platelets are the smallest of anything we've talked about so far. They're roughly 2 to 3 micrometers, much smaller than an RBC. In terms of their lifespan, platelets are only around for a few days, not too long, especially relative to some of the much longer-lived cells. And in terms of their role, platelets are there to assist in hemostasis and to make sure that the blood clots appropriately. So we'll get those two roles down, hemostasis and clotting. So where do these cells come from? All of our blood cells grow up in the bone marrow, specifically in the red marrow, in a process known as hematopoiesis. In adults, this takes place in some specific places. The proximal long bones of the leg, including the femur, which I'll draw in here, and to a lesser extent the tibia, which I'll add in here as well. But more importantly, the major bones along the midline, including the bony pelvis, which I'll outline here in white, the vertebral bodies in the spine, the sternum, which I'll shade here in white, and the ribs. If any of you have ever donated bone marrow, you'll know it's harvested from the iliac crests, which I'll show here in light blue, since lots of hematopoietic stem cells are located there. Hematopoiesis is a process of sequential development, meaning that all mature blood cells come from a common precursor stem cell. And we'll talk later on about just how these cells develop and what cell lines they belong to, but for now it's important to realize that the mature cells that are in our blood, the ones that we just discussed, start out in the bone marrow as precursor cells, drawn here in red. The bone marrow is like a nursery for the developing blood cells, outlined here in yellow, where they can grow and develop without facing the harsh environment of the peripheral circulatory system. There are a couple of important points to be made here. The first is that, for the most part, only mature blood cells make it into the peripheral blood. Once they've developed enough in the nursery, they exit into peripheral circulation. There are two exceptions. One is the granulocytes, the NEB cells. For these three cell types, the second to last stage in their development, the so-called band cell, may also be visible in peripheral blood. The other exception is the RBC. Its second to last stage in development gets a special name, the reticulocyte. It enters circulation while still immature, but it reaches maturity in circulation after about a day. Reticulocytes make up about 1% of the total RBCs in the body. If younger, immature cells are seen in the blood smear, it indicates that an overgrowth of immature cells is occurring somewhere in the bone marrow and spilling out into peripheral circulation. In the case of reticulocytes, this may be compensatory for the various anemias, or it may turn out to be leukemia, a cancer of the developing blood cells in the bone marrow, or some other disease process. But the main point is this. Only mature blood cells should be visible in peripheral blood, with the few exceptions mentioned earlier. This brings us to the second main point about blood cells. Their production exists in equilibrium with their removal. You can think of it as a simple flow diagram, with production on one side, removal on the other, and peripheral circulation in between. Normally, the rate of production of blood cells is equal to the rate of their removal. That is, the amount of blood cells in the body, and of each type, stays relatively constant. If there's a problem on either side, either too little or too much production, or too little or too much removal, this can lead to problems. Thinking about this flow diagram will help you in thinking about the potential causes of the problem facing a given patient. Too few red blood cells, for example, is either because of too much removal or not enough production. Each problem has its own set of potential causes and treatment regimens.